What do you do when everything is going wrong? See? You're not in the shot. Your plans, whatever they are, seem to be going down the tubes. No matter what you try, everywhere you turn seems to be going wrong. That you go to the left and you run into a problem. You go to the right and there seems to be an issue. You try to stand still and things seem to act up and need your attention. What do you do? Sometimes you wait on the Lord. That's always a good thing. Because if you committed it to prayer, then you know God is at work on it and in it for you. Well, what do you do when things are going really bad? When it seems like everything you've tried just doesn't seem to give you any peace. Nothing's working. Blah! And you feel like cacas and poo-poos. <laughs> well, you sure don't feel like rejoicing and you don't go, Oh, I'm such a happy camper. Because you're not happy. You know, sometimes you have to accept the fact that you don't always feel and you can't generate and you can't, by faith, create in you that wonder and excitement that you should have because you may have failed in some way or you may have fallen down or you may have low blood sugars or, <laughs> or, or you may be under spiritual impression and none of these things do you know about but you know to turn to your God to turn to your Father in Heaven to humble yourself before the Lord your God and He shall lift you up because there's a time to pray and not a time to intercede, and not a time to pray in tongues, and not a time to be all so heavenly minded that you have these outrageous, long-winded prayers that you have it in your mind that you know exactly how you're going to pray, and what you're going to say, and you're going to confess this sin, and you're going to profess this thing, and you're going to quote this scripture, and you're going to do this, that, and the other thing. Sometimes you just need to talk to God, you know, to say, you know, God, I don't feel right. I don't look right. I just don't. Nothing I'm doing is right. Sometimes those times are a good time to be repetitious or vain in some ways because Jesus gave us the Lord's Prayer and there's a thousand teachings if not a million on the Lord's Prayer. Pray after this manner so we don't repeat it or pray in this manner so we do repeat it. So you can go there if you're not if you're Protestant or non-Protestant, if you're Catholic, Greek, Orthodox, or whatever, it don't matter. Because you can say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass us against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's not vain repetition, unless you are doing it vainly and repetitiously. Sometimes people are doing it in faith. So don't fault the person's faith for what they do in the least of these things or at the moment of desperate need, the most that they can bring together to our Father. Because the Holy Spirit is going to take no matter what you say and flush it. Because he's going to interpret it to groanings and things unutterable before the Father in heaven. And Jesus, as our high priest, is going to take that and intercede to the Father on our behalf. So you're going to wind up with what you want, sort of, according to what the Holy Spirit feels is best needed in your life at the time that you need it. So it really isn't a whole big deal about some of this stuff, you know, unless you're being seen by people like, you know, you've got to, Get up and say, Oh, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. God knows. God loves. God cares. And if you're having a bad day, God knows. You can say, God, I'm having a bad day. And admit it. 
And sometimes, no matter what you do, it's going to be a bad day. Because you can still rejoice and be glad, for this is the day that the Lord has made, good and bad of it. Even if it is bad, God will turn it for good as you look back on it when you've gone past it and gone through it. He took Peter and John and James and went up to a mountain to pray. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered and his raiment was white and glistening. They saw his glory. If I have found grace in thy sight, show me now thy way. When Jesus took these three disciples up into that high mountain apart, he brought them into close communion with himself. They saw no man but Jesus only, and it was good to be there. Heaven is not far from those who tarry on the mount with their Lord. At times, you minister of God, or you servant of the Most High God, or you deacon or elder or pastor or teacher or priest or prophet need to get off of the ministry and get away from the calling and quit doing the internet and quit being what you think you ought to be and take a moment to go to the mountaintop alone with your Lord in prayer. In other words, there comes a time when nothing of this earth will satisfy no matter what you do, irregardless of what dynamic ministry you think you got and how wonderful worship is and how you can blast the music, you know, 60 decibels above the normal hearing range and you think that you've got, you know, the goosebumps from the Holy Spirit and it's just this bass that's blasting your, you know, sonic <laughs> compendium out of kilter. But there's always a time and there's always a place where God will take the natural to become supernatural as you walk from earth into the presence of God in his kingdom, which is coming to this earth that he will set up. And when the glory of the Lord has come upon the earth, it shall be light and it shall be good and it shall be revealed as it was intended to be from the beginning. That we would say, well, what of those that had they been in the garden, what would it have been like? We shall see that and know. Because we who should judge angels, likewise will see what it was like for Adam to be in the garden when we are in the millennium. Now I know there's a lot of people that, you know, think they got cities set up, you know, and they're going to do some little, you know, kingly thing, you know, and they've got crowns and thrones, you know, and I don't know, you know, God bless them. You know, the Gentiles exercise lordship over one another, but Jesus said, let that not be named among you, but rather who would be the greatest in the kingdom, let him be the servant of all. So I hope that they learn in the kingdom, if they don't get what they want by being kings and priests, that they become a kingdom of priests, that they would be subservient to those whom they minister to, that they already are heirs of salvation, joint heirs with Jesus Christ, already inherited everything, and not to be thought greater than Jesus would rather give it all back to him and restore the peace and joy of communion with God and fellowship with his spirit in the kingdom of God as it's here on earth with all of creation. Maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> if I put in charge like a king, I would be sadly disappointed. For I see nowhere in scripture that a king is great, but I have one king that is. So, though he is king of kings and lord of lords, and I'm sure that there's going to be some kings and some lords, you know, I for myself will not. You know, I'm a servant of the Most High, and I'm just a child of God, and should it be that God has mercy on me and extends to me the welcome into the kingdom of God and blesses me with walking into the millennium with him, then I would rather be a friend than have a throne. I would rather walk and talk with Jesus in his glory than to have any glory bestowed upon me. I would rather take my throne and cast it down at his feet, my throne, my crown, and cast it down at his feet than to take unto myself anything that's due his name, for it was by his grace and his mercy that he accomplished his salvation through me, in me, and around me to anyone else that there possibly could have been. In and of myself I did nothing. And only of himself, by his own will, he did all things.
Who has not, in moments of meditation and prayer, caught a glimpse of opening gates? Who has not, in the secret place of holy communion, felt the rush of some white surging wave of emotion, a foretaste of the joy of the blessed? The Master had times and places for quiet converse with his disciples, once on the peak of Hermon, and oftener on the sacred slopes of Olivet. Every Christian should have his Olivet. Most of us, especially in the cities and towns, live at high pressure. From early morning until bedtime, we are exposed to the world, to the principalities and the powers that are in the kingdom of Satan as they are personified in the kingdom of man, as he has made for himself likewise cities and domains and dominions that oppress us as we are the light that is a city set on a hill. It cannot be hidden, but we shine in the midst of a dark and perverse generation. From the early morning until bedtime, we expose to the world amid all the mail a storm of how chance for quiet thoughts, for God's word, or for prayer, and for heart fellowship. Because we have so little time, we have so little peace, so little joy alone with God. We always have that opportunity for communion with the saints, to be entertained by the church, to be confronted by the world, to be conformed by the ministry of Sunday morning, or some teaching, or some exhortation. Daniel needed to have an Olivet in his chamber amid Babylon's roar and idolatries. Peter found his on the housetop in Joppa, and Martin Luther found his in the upper room at Wittenberg, which is still held sacred. Dr. Joseph Parker once said, if we do not get back to visions, peeps into heaven, and consciousness of the higher glory and the larger light, we shall lose our religion. Our altar will become a bare stone unblessed by visitation from heaven. Herein is the last world's need today, men who have seen the Lord. Come close to him. He may take you up today onto the mountaintop where he took Peter and his blunderings and James and John and those sons of thunders who again and again so utterly misunderstood their master and his mission. There is no reason why he should not take you. So don't shut yourself out of it and say, oh, but these wonderful visions and revelations of the Lord are only for certain people, for he chose only those to whom had already fallen flat on their face and failed miserably. And even in the midst of that revelation, Peter opens his mouth and shows how it's not about righteous doing or thinking, but rather God loving you so much he would reveal himself to you. So today, if you're having a bad day, if you don't feel right like I don't, then I ask you to pray, to take a moment to stay your hand from doing those things you want to do, that you might reach your hand out to him who chose to do what he promised he would always do and never leave you nor forsake you, for he's with you always, even up to the end of the age. And as such, can we ever deny the comfort that should God open up the ceiling now and reveal the heavens to us, we know we would see Jesus seated at the right hand of the Father in glory. And we know that we would be welcome if he just bid us to come home today.